let's talk about before we get to like I know we're talking about fatherhood now and making babies. So I just want to switch the conversation for a second before we go too deep down that way because we'll come back to that. Is I just would love both your men's perspective of what what is the role of a father? What does fatherhood mean to you guys? Um, and so Brent, I'd love to ask you that question of what what do you believe is the role of a father? Wow, I think for me it's become sort of as a protector and provider. Well, let me let me start that again. The initial thought process was protector and provider and to mold little humans into what I think they should become. But um, over the last, you know, seven or eight years with Harper and then three and one with the little people, I've sort of come to learn that we're more just facilitators and guides to, you know, and for me, it's more about creating opportunities for them to discover who they are going to be. And as hard as it is for me where I want to step in and, and structure something or mold something and I get it wrong a lot of the time to a raised eyebrow and a gentle, hey, we're, remember we're working on this. But yeah, it's just to be, a, to be a guide and to offer incredible opportunities for self-development and exploration and discovery. And um, that's been far more rewarding for me than being the provider and the protector of my family um, is to watch them grow. And, and I've learned about self-discovery from them in how to be a better dad. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the kids are the greatest teachers, I feel. And yeah, it's been I think, amazing. think relationships in general are, are, are great teachers to show us our shadows and where our work is, but like our little, yeah. our little ones there. Yeah. What you just said just deeply resonated with me, man. I remember I wanted to be a fighter pilot when I was a kid. I wanted to be like what, Tom, actually Tom Cruise. I, I wanted to be, Cruise, I wanted yeah. to be a bartender <laughs> and I wanted to fly fighter planes, <laughs> cut and top guns. Yeah. But I remember dad pushed so hard for it that I rebelled as a teenager. I actually at high school took all like physics and all the, all the things that I needed to get in the university. But then I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it because dad pushed so hard. And now as the father of three, I want nothing more than go on a surf trip with my kids. And they're only five, three, and two at the moment. But just what you said of like being a facilitator and the guide, I don't want to in, like enforce or impose my beliefs and what I deeply desire onto them because they may not want yeah. to surf. You know what I mean? My boys yeah. might, might want to do ballet or dancing, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Man. So, uh, yeah, man, yeah, beautiful. Uh, how about you, Shane? What do you think um, our role is? As, as soon as you said that, those same words popped up into my mind: provide and protect. Um, and yeah, guiding. So I. I try and use my life's experiences now to go back to how we can maybe give some advice in their younger years to keep them fit and well and healthy um, growing up. So, yeah, it's, it, yeah, sorry, sorry to use your same words again, but um, yeah, guiding, protecting, providing, um, and just giving them, giving them my all when I can and um, being there for them um, whenever. Whenever she needs me, then I, I try and make myself available. Yeah, beautiful. Well, all both of you men, and I had the same belief around provider protecting, is that role of a of a provider, uh, a provider of a father. And I speak to like my father in law briefly with my dad, but then the, that, that next generation that's older than us about what they thought their role of fatherhood was, and it was those same two words. But I feel that. They, they had a different connotation or a different um, meaning. And so yeah. this would like to talk about, if it's okay with you guys, about your relationship with uh, your fathers um, and how was that, how was it, uh, what, was, what was good about it? What would you have liked to have better? Um, what did you receive? What didn't you receive? Um, and how, how was your, the way that your father was a father and the way that you're being a father right now what are the similarities and what the what are the differences? Why well, start with you, Shane? Yeah, so I grew up. My my dad was from Malta, um, so he he left school when he was nine years old to start building, um, to start providing for his family, and then moved out to Australia by himself when he was eighteen to again keep working and sending money home. Um, so his whole life was working, um, just Monday to Friday, which was good. So we had the weekends together, but there was. We had no emotion or feeling in our family at all from mum or dad. Um, there was no I love yous, no arguing, no affection. So it was just it was just life, I guess. Um, just a, a flat line sort of no real highs or lows. It was just this is what life is. Um, I was 
very spoilt as a child. So I was into competitive sailing um, and dad had the funds to be able to give me whatever I needed. And I think he was trying to to win some trophies through me as well. So he was buying me the best of everything. Um, he was like a, I, I was like a professional even when I was 10. I'd, I'd rock up to the sailing club. He'd have the boat ready to go. He'd put it in the water. I'd go and sail. I'd come back, step off the boat, go and shower. He'd wash everything down, de-rig it, put it all away for me. So I was I was very spoiled um, and I grew up not respecting money because I didn't have to do anything for it. So that that came back to bite me through my early working years once I left the nest and had to fend for myself and realised it wasn't a, an endless supply. Um, and then, and then that's, that's something that I'm trying to instill into my daughter now. So she's really good with money and her mum's really good. And we're actually just talking about that yesterday, how, how important it is, um, and why I haven't been so good with it because, um, I, I got given a lot when I was younger. Um, and then the, the way that I've molded my fatherhood is, I give my daughter a lot. I still make her work and earn for a lot of things, um, but our affection is huge. So there's 500 I love yous a day. There's a lot of kisses and cuddles throughout the day um, because I didn't I didn't realise the impact that that had and the amount of therapists and stuff I've seen over my years. And the first questions is always, are your parents together and how is your relationship? And I thought, why is this such an important question? But as I'm getting older, I... I definitely realise why it is because you get these things ingrained in your mind um, from such an early age. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much doing the opposite to what my dad had done um, to my daughter now. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Brendan? Yeah, a bit of a mixed mixed bag, actually. So my folks separated when I was quite young and um, my dad went to bat to keep us and ended up winning the court case. And so it was just my brother and I that lived with my dad. And, you know, he made sacrifices, changed businesses, quit jobs and stuff like that to be around more. But he was kind of an absentee dad. Um, And he sort of got involved in his own life and with girlfriends and that sort of thing. And he would just leave us to our own devices. He'd hook us up with movies and pizza and all that kind of thing so that we were in a great place and we never wanted for anything. Um, but I, don't, I was talking to my wife about it the other day. Like, I don't actually remember doing hobby type stuff with my dad. And when my stepdad came along, he was a fisher, hunter, outdoorsman, and he taught me all of those things. So he taught me about the bush and hunting and fishing and diving. And, um, and I don't remember throughout my lifetime, I don't remember doing any of that stuff with my dad. I remember like driving cars. That was a love that we shared. And it's still a love that I have a deep love of cars and driving. And I remember my old man used to just take us for a drive on a Sunday. We'd just like get in the Devin in the Bruce, Benz or the Beamer man. or whatever and just go for a drive. Yeah. Like that that was the afternoon. Yeah. Um, so there's a real love that's come from that. And that's something that I've carried through my years now as well. And something that I share with my kids. I let them drive the cars. My oldest comes with me to the golf course. I get her to drive the golf buggy. So there's that side of thing. But I think the contrast for me is that I'm working on being a much more present dad than I had and to actually engage. I I felt loved, but I feel like my kids know how I feel good and bad. You know, they see, they see the emotion, they see the breakdown, they see the tears, they see the anger. We revisit the conversations, even with my little ones where I can sit down with them and say, Hey, it didn't go quite the way I'd hoped it did. I'm sorry for this or, hey, how can we do this? And and it's an open dialogue where I remember like my old man used to just go and sit in the study and turn his music on and close the doors. And and that was sort of, that was the relationship. I was hearing Elvis playing through closed doors. Yeah, man. You hit so many points that just like triggered all of my stuff, man. Like the car thing. It's, I, yeah. I love going for cruises and we have the muscle cars come past here on the sunny coast and that's the next thing. It's like I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting a muscle car. It's got to be a bench seat so the kids can sit up front with me yeah. and then breath our five-year-olds like, Daddy, we've got to get a yellow one. So it's like <laughs> together we're manifesting this this car thing. Um, yes, and it is, yeah, love that presence aspect. Um, very similar to you, man. My dad left when I was seven and yeah. then like – a couple of things about what uh, you said you, uh, your father didn't really get to teach you many things and your stepdad did. I, I had no one teach me how to shave, bro. 
So like dad left and I had my stepdad and I was very rebellious in my teenage, teenage years. So I didn't know how to shave. Um, and so that like that rite of passage of going into puberty, that kind of stuff, there was no actual father figure to teach me how to do that. Um, and there was many of those times within my childhood, I had to sort of figure it out on my own or ask all the kids or lead or the other father, father roles in my life were like my footy coaches and that kind of stuff. Um, and I li- literally just did a psychotherapy session um, about four months ago, uh, three, three, four months ago. And what came up for me was the 17 year old version of myself. So going through this point, about to hit adulthood and my dad wasn't there. And so I went through all of this turmoil uh, that was stuck, all these emotions that were stuck in my psyche around um, what did I really need as that 17 year old boy? And all I craved was my dad to put his hand on my, uh, like put his hand on my hand and say, mate, I'm going to show you the way. Not, not do it for me, but show me. Like, this is where you go. This is how you have direction. This is how you, um, like, pr- call in that life. Is that everything that um, you guys mentioned around uh, providing, we, uh, um, our fathers provided very well financially for the family. They, they set us all up and they set us, and that was their role back then, was to set up and look after the family. But then things that you guys have said, and this is what I'm doing as well, what we're providing is emotional support, affection, and presence. So it's a lot more hands-on and what you just mentioned too around um, it, it's a two-way street with you and your children of like actually get to know who you are as a man. I think that's something that uh, I, not until I was, it was like 32, had my first conscious conversation with my dad and I had to dig and pry. Like it wasn't an open conversation. Like I had to ask for all this information <laughs> about what was his challenges as a father? Like did he have men that he could rely on and, and talk to and, my dad was very forthright with everything and mentioned that he was alone and that he didn't have anyone to talk to. He'd go to the pub, but they couldn't, he couldn't talk about emotions. Um, I never saw my dad cry. I've never heard him say, I love you or I'm proud of you. Yet I did feel it. I, I played high-level high rugby league and the first rep team I made was I was 12 years old. So dad went away with me and I used to travel four times, five times a year with, uh, with footy. Dad was always there. Mum couldn't afford to come, but dad could, could come. And it was really interesting because I, I loved having my dad there. And he was at the time a photographer. So he's always involved, but was always involved with the parents. And, and he was part of the community. Though, got to a point when I was almost 18. And I oh, know actually I was 18. Um, I got in a lot of trouble. And I had, uh, had to go to court um, on some charges. And I went in um, just with a, a, a solicitor, um, the, the duty solicitor that the, the government gives you. And the judge looked at me. He's like, mate. Where's your, where's your legal representation? I pointed to that the man. And he's like, you need to go get a barrister. You're about to go to jail, mate. And I was just like, what the fuck? And he's like, dude, like you, you're going to serve time. Um, I'm going to adjourn this for you. And as an 18-year-old boy, that was, and I'm going to say boy because I was not a man at all. I was so fucking scared. So scared. And so I needed money for a barrister. And I asked my dad, and he's the first person I rang, and he said no. And... I started asking, I had enough foresight to start asking myself the questions of like, why would you say no to help me? I'm about to go to jail. Um, and what you, so I can't remember who said about the trophy. It was like, um, I'm like, he, you're just glory hunting. The actual only time you want to hang out with me is when I'm playing football. I'm, I'm not your son. I'm Blaze the footy star. And there's this title that dad was really attached to. And so in that moment, I'm like, cool. I'm going to test this theory. So I was at the height of my football career, had a contract with Canberra, and I had a playing manager. I'm like, I'm going to give up football for a year. And I did. And my dad didn't speak to me for a fucking year. And then it was- Wow, that's hard. Bro, it was a really, yeah. And so there was a lot of conflict there and there was so much hatred and anger and aggression. Like he'd already walked out to me once as a seven-year-old. And that was my belief. Like it was between him and mum. But as a young kid, I'm yeah, feeling like yeah, he, yeah, ab- should, yeah. he abandoned me. Yeah. But then for the, to see that he didn't talk to me, I remember one Christmas he bought me an actual trophy cabinet for Christmas. <laughs> That's what he bought me. You've just, fucking, you've just got to fill it. Fuck it. And and that was the thing because wow. I had all of these trophies, and that was his mentality. And and so many of us, I got caught in that as well. That materialistic world, and it was about the trophies. But then everything that we're talking about is 
this emotional affection and presence for a kid. There's no trophies in that. 